how did this happen? That's the story, you know, ordinary people just taken out of uh, ordinary life. You know, they say like you see everything in your life before your death, and this little North London white boy who likes his Arsenal football club, and what's he doing in Africa about to get killed by a machete? You make it sound like a movie, definitely, and it's almost entertaining and horrifying equally. Hello and welcome to Darius Bazargan, an award-winning journalist and a filmmaker who made documentaries for the BBC, Al Jazeera, you name it. And you have your own production company yeah, as well. Right, yeah. And currently you're working on a documentary about Nazanin Zakari Ratcliffe, a British Iranian prisoner who's in Iran, currently in Evin prison. She served a five year sentence that was caused by you know, some completely fraudulent accusations. And now there's another year added to her sentence. And Correct. even after that, she won't be able to come home to Britain where her husband and her seven-year-old daughter, Gabriella, are waiting for her. Mm. How did you decide on this topic? Well, I came across it sort of obliquely. I was started to work at Channel 4 News and I was looking for stories and this um, incident, the, the seizure of Nazanin had just happened and I, I was looking at it with some interest because I've got an Iranian background myself, I'm Iranian, Polish, Russian, German, Jewish, a lot of mixed. mixtures, a very big mixture of people but I have a, this Iranian citizenship which is a kind of um, albatross, you can't get rid of it whether you like it or not and you're seen as an Iranian citizen if your father is one whether you like it or not. So I'd been a couple of times to Iran, but was aware that my journalism would make it possibly risky to, to go back again. And I saw that this woman had been seized and there was no obvious reason for it. You know, and that I, was back in 2016 when you started paying correct. attention yeah, to the Yeah, that story. was in April. And I was looking around because the Iranians, they do a lot of things that are unpleasant and they do a lot of things that seem cruel, but they're not irrational. They don't do it for no reason. There's almost always, they feel that they're the injured party and they're yeah. getting retaliation for it. But the injury is often historic. You have to look back. And I was like, what could have caused this? And I was digging around various stories and I, I came across uh, from 1980, a story about a debt, a, a military debt that the British had uh, incurred to Iran. Basically the Shah in that time was determined to become the third most powerful military force in the world. Um, this is in the Cold War, so he can't be the first or the second. That's the United States military and the, the Soviet Union's military forces. These are not things that you can, but third was possible. He had a lot of money and he started to upgrade his military forces massively with the best technology that um, money could buy. Very similar to what the Saudis have been doing in the UAE. And he decided that he wanted the best tank for his army. And the best tank at that time was made by the British and it was the Chieftain tank. And it wasn't even as good as he wanted it. He wanted the next generation. So he put money in to building the next generation. And to secure this, um, he paid up front in advance for 1,500 battle tanks, um, which is worth about 400 million pounds in today's money. But I think realistically, you're talking about billions upon billions in today's money. Um, and he paid in advance, and then the revolution in Iran happened. The Shah was deposed. And that was in 1979. That's right. And um, the long story short is that the British kept the money and didn't deliver the tanks. Um, they may have argued that it was a strategic risk for them, or but basically it, it's gone through international courts. It, it's been acknowledged that um, the British owe this money to the Iranians, and they still haven't paid. And it seems that the Iranians have decided to um, up the ante in this and, and the, the method that they've used to put pressure on the British is to take dual nationals as hostages. And they've done this before. The Islamic Republic of Iran, to be honest, has been taking hostages since its inception to try and get and things back. How many hostages British Iranian nationals are there in prison at the moment? There's three that are well known and there are more than that. I would say under 10 but some of the families are not, are not keen to publicise that. So anyway, I realised that there was this debt behind it and, and, and this cover-up by the government. And I approached Richard Ratcliffe, the husband, and um, I said, do you know why this is happening? He said, I'm not sure. I've, I've been hearing there's some sort of pressure. The British have got to do something. They've been telling my wife. And I said, have a look at this stuff. And he had a look at it. And he said, you know what, I think that's 
that's what it is. And the more her interrogations went on, the more it became clear that it was a particular amount of money. And um, we became not exactly collaborators, but I was starting this documentary and starting to get access with him. And he could see that I was someone who was really was interested in the backstory and the history. And obviously he picked a very different approach because you have other families that are worried that publicity will do more damage than good. Why yeah. do you think he decided to go public and start this massive campaign I rather think, than doing it kind of hush-hush? I think partly the reason is that he's very, he's British, British. He's born here, Nazanin and his daughter is British and born here. And he, most of the other dual nationals are families who've acquired British citizenship. They're actually Iranians. And I think in the corner of their, in the back of their minds, they're thinking, if we annoy the British government who are telling us to be quiet about this, what if they yeah, take our passport away or something? Yeah. You know, you can't do that under law, but you wouldn't feel confident um, necessarily, especially if you come from a country where the state can't be trusted as much. Uh, but Richard is very British. You know, he almost looks like a young David Cameron sometimes. He really looks British. He sounds British. He's, and I think he was just outraged at it. And he was initially not believing that the British government wouldn't support him every step of the way. And actually sabotage the efforts Absolutely. to release her. Because as we remember, Boris Johnson, when he was a, a foreign secretary, famously said that um, she was simply teaching journalism, which was used as an evidence yeah. in court against Nazanin, which was a horrendous blunder. I don't know how they didn't kick him out after that. But anyway, yeah. that's, you know, the history well, will judge that. It's Yeah, really, he's been fighting two states, mm -hmm. an obviously hostile foreign state. And then it's like one of those American movies. The guy goes to his own government and it turns out that they're yeah. corrupt as well. Or they, they've got vested interests that are not in helping a second rate citizen. Let's face it, she wasn't born here. She's brown skinned. Mm -hmm. She's not as British. In fact, one of the foreign office ministers said she's British documentary, uh, you know, in terms of documentation, but it's not truly British. Um, and he found that he was fighting a, a sort of war on two fronts, one against a uh, hostile Iranian uh, government, or at least the Revolutionary Guards segment of it, and um, a, a war against his own government, who had the, their own reasons for not wanting to pay the debt. The Ministry of Defence in Britain has stepped in a number of times mm -hmm. in recent years to stop that money being paid. And one of the arguments was that the Revolutionary Guards are effectively a hostile force in the Middle East. They would take the money for themselves, uh, and that could be spent in theatres where British troops could be vulnerable, such as Iraq. Yeah, so it seems like um, the Iranian government were looking for the perfect victim, someone who is worth paying that money for. It looks like something that would shock and, and, and gain headlines, and indeed it, it worked. They have other hostages who have not perhaps got the, as high a profile because they're Middle Eastern men of a certain age, older, not quite as, you know, it just obviously seems like she must be a prisoner of, you know, a hostage rather than a spy. You wouldn't take your small baby with you, however committed you were to espionage. I don't yeah. think so anyway. And just a little side note, um, uh, while you're focusing as an in, you also released a short documentary for Amnesty International last year, That's drawing right. attention to another daughter of another prisoner who's, who spent many years in Iranian jail. Um, and you made a very touching documentary about Gabriela and um, Elika. Elika, that's who's right, a 20, yeah. There's a 28 um, year gap between right. them, but they're baking cookies together and yeah. they're signing a postcard to Boris Johnson. Do you think he watched this small documentary? Uh, Johnson, I think, I'm not sure whether he watched the documentary, but he certainly was aware, you know, he got the cards and he was aware that there was follow up. It's quite possible that he did. Um, yeah, this is an example, basically. There is another hostage case that's quite high profile, which is a man called Anushe Ashuri. But because he's middle-aged, he's 67, and initially his wife was running the campaign, mm -hmm. and it wasn't getting media cut through in Britain. And I, I talked to them because I, you know, I got to know them as well. They know Richard's family. I said, you know, honestly, you have to look at these campaigns almost like branding. Nazanin works because she's a younger woman, mm -hmm. you know, she's got a little daughter who's here, Richard is tireless, he's British, and so on. Did you manage what, to speak to Nazanin at all? Oh yes, I've spoken yeah. to her a few times. Do you talk on WhatsApp or, I mean, we can on WhatsApp, talk on, on Yeah, FaceTime we talk on, or... uh, on these um, uh, communications apps, and sometimes she's made video phone calls. I've mm -hmm. got phone calls she's made from Evan Prison, and things like that which are recorded. They're all really unique and interesting and exclusive. And I can't use any of it until Nazanin is on the outside of Iranian airspace. And what, what was it like filming the family? I mean, how are they coping at the moment after the news that another year will be added 
to well, the sentence? It's a, it's a difficult one to exactly pin down. But I think that at certain points that they they get carried away with what seems to be going on, but they try to be um, very pragmatic. You know, they've been in this place before. They've had their hopes raised and dashed many times. You know, uh, and it could happen again. And I think that especially for Gabriella now, she, she sensed there was a time, maybe a couple of months ago, when it really looked like, you know, the five years had ended, they've taken this um, ankle tag off her, the tracking tag that was on Nazanin's ankle off. And she's just quite, I think she'll believe adults when something's in front of her, you know, if you promise her an ice cream, she'll say, give it to me now, then I'll say thank you, you know. If you promise her a toy, she wants to see that toy. There's no point in promising her mum's coming home Adults have lied to this child deliberately or inadvertently for half her life, no, more than half her life. I would say, you know, 80% of her life has been adults in positions of authority letting her down. Yes, she's a very resilient child, but tough, but in, in a ways that you don't, you wouldn't want your child to have learned of course. that sort of resilience. I became aware of the story years ago and I just couldn't help but constantly look for updates you know you could just look at you know her photographs and all the little presents and it, it just it's so striking and it's very um i think it grabs you because it's very human scale yeah. and, and at the same time there's international politics and and big plots and large amounts of money and absurd duplicity but the ordinary core heroes of this <laughs> is it's like a fairy tale you know you've got the princess taken off into the dark dungeon the brave knight who has to try and rescue her and then finds that everyone's against him. No one can be trusted. The innocent daughter who can, uh, you know, has got, got a sharp mouth and wisecracks and doesn't trust the grown-ups and vi you know, the, the, I mean, the Iranian revolutionary guards, number one <laughs> villain for Hollywood in the world. You know, you, you couldn't ask for more villainous villains and they're yeah. quite happy to play that role as well. And then corrupt politicians here and a, a straight, ordinary guy living a straight, ordinary life with his normal family that he thought, you know, they were hoping to have another kid and he, was, he works in a, he's an accountant, you know, not an Ozark one, a normal one, you know, uh, and uh, suddenly he's in the middle of this nightmare situation. Well, his wife is, of course, in, more in the middle of it, but I don't have access to the prison. You know, it's not his job to be the campaigner for his, but that, that, we may look at him on the news, oh, oh, Richard Ratcliffe, that's what he does in life. He campaigns for his wife. No, he was meant to be just a dad. Going to work, coming back, she was meant to be a mum. Going to work, coming back, the daughter, going to school, have a sister or a brother, you know, go to the park, go to the shop. They shouldn't know about the Revolutionary Guards and Chieftain Tanks and the nuclear negotiations and whether Rezaei becoming president is better than if uh, a different uh, Revolutionary Guards candidate gets in and what the different foreign ministers of Britain are saying or doing. That shouldn't be on their radar. How did this happen? That's the story, you know, ordinary people just taken out of uh, ordinary life, like spy film or something like that. And when will we be able to watch this documentary? Because Ask the Revolutionary I'm Guards when they're going to let uh, Nazanin Ratcliffe back in England and, and then we'll be able to, to work with it. I um, kind of went into the rabbit hole of your YouTube channel <laughs> <laughs> for the past few days, you know, all those uh, fascinating documentaries Thank that take you. you all over the world, um, usually the parts of the world that are overlooked, um, mm. you know, in Africa and Afghanistan and the Middle East. I just started thinking about you and how you decided to go into this profession and how you picked those regions. My whole existence is kind of predicated on ordinary people being pushed around by big forces, you know, of war and of uh, uprisings. And I thought, how interesting that is, you know, um, that I should come to be born in a safe place like London with these opportunities. Um, but I'm kind of always interested in what, where the wild things are, you know, like the uh, children's book, the, the kid who dreams yeah. of the island full of monsters. And of course, there are places full of monsters, human monsters and, and monstrosities that we've created organizations and structures. Your story that really stayed with me was what happened to you and your colleagues in Malawi yeah. um, in 2018. Yeah. Because you mentioned before that was a situation where, you know, you could have you, you could have been killed yes. because you were uh, filming a documentary on ritual killings where um, bodies of people and children are being used um, as talismans and yeah, certain body parts. Yeah, it was a difficult parts. story. I mean, the interesting thing is I, I had a bad feeling about that job 
from the beginning. Before the beginning. And I did the reconnaissance and I was like, I'm not going to take this. I didn't quite like the production company. And you collaborated with a very famous Ghanaian I collaborated with a very journalist. famous Ghanaian journalist, Anna Sarameo. Yeah. And that's his brilliant, very nice man. He always hides very, his face. Always hides his face. Mm -hmm. But I did the reconnaissance and we, I'd found with the local producer a witch doctor who indeed was engaging in body part um, sacrifice or was willing to use human body parts and had a track record of doing this and uh, he wanted to work with us because he thought I was representing a rich African businessman who was going to come into the area and invest. Kind of filmed it uh, we filmed it with secret you, cameras, yeah. yeah, hidden cameras. And this um, rich African businessman was an ass. Once we had set up the mm -hmm. prima facie evidence, we came in with the team undercover as a rich African businessman and his entourage into northern Malawi, supposedly as investors, but he was, I want to get involved in the um, body part ritual magic sacrifice game because uh, rich businessmen and politicians in that part of the world, some of them believe that using human body parts in, in traditional medicine will give you powers or make you wealthier or make you uh, win an elections, that sort of thing. And uh, it was very popular in uh, that part of the world. But in Tanzania, the police had cr cracked down on it. So the sort of trade for getting the mm. harvest had moved south uh, to uh, northern Malawi, which is where we were. And people were being harvested for organs, basically. There was a, a murder trade going on and people being killed and their body parts being children trafficked. Well. And, and children especially. Uh, they thought that the brains and genitals of young children were uh, particularly magic so we were set up we set up a meeting uh, to film it secretly with this witch doctor and uh, with uh, he had brought someone who he said would carry out the killings for him and, and this man seemed to be legitimate he was talking about murdering several people quite believable um, had, had some details that seemed to check out and we, we filmed them all on secret camera and it was great and they confessed to everything and, and we had it all in the bag and it was all fine uh, except that the secret cameras all failed simultaneously four of them failed simultaneously and that was freaking us out oh because we were God. like is this black magic i mean like literally we one of the cameras as it gets near the witch doctor it just, it's going wrong the audio goes and then another one the audio goes down so we had this very a difficult situation of having to try and convince the witch doctor and his serial killer sidekick to meet us again and film it all over again because we got more secret cameras sent out from London and how can we persuade them to talk about it once you've broached the subject like that so we arranged it again but then they said well we don't like where you wanted to meet we want to call the shots now you know you're asking us to do this all over again we're going to choose the place and I said no guys we can't I want to be, I mean, I was pretending to be a, a minion in the structure, but I said to my people, we can't do this. You know, this is all about control and we're handing control over to the people that we are trying to trap. They could rob us. They could have other people waiting. We don't know what the area is. So they chose a place and it, it wasn't far from where we were staying. It was only about a mile from the main road, but we went up there in these two cars, a nice Jeep and the fixers, Henry's car. And we got out and we filmed it all over again. And they provided the same information. The same information. Okay. We got it all over again. It was it was a this difficult one. This time the cameras didn't fail. Hopefully. This time the cameras we felt didn't fail. At least we you know. But on the way up there, it had been tense. Like we passed some villagers and they were playing football in a field, and one of them had looked really aggressive at me and sort of done like that. And I was like, what's he? You know. But I, I put it out of my mind. And then again, there was sort of a lot of interest. It was getting it was darker than it should have been. It should have all happened at 3 p.m. But mm -hmm. The local producer was late and then he picked the other guys up late and by the time everyone was assembled to start this, another loss of control. It was now about 5 p.m. instead of 3 p.m. and the sun goes down in those places and suddenly we're in the dark by a village talking horrifying. about murdering villagers and what happens? The villagers turn up, okay, drunk, armed, not one or two, like dozens of them you know they've all come up the hill to get us they've worked out that they think we are what we're pretending to be foreigners with mischief of killing them in mind and they are determined that they are going to kill us first and so we the situation just collapsed from us being clever and uh, doing secret undercover recording of these uh, witch doctor and his murderous sidekick to our 
team just surrounded by hostile people and who said we didn't gonna... expect it obviously at all well funnily enough just... I, it was on the risk assessment very small <laughs> i said oh what if we, we get caught in our own you know or our, our own sort of um subterfuge you know we're, we're too successful and we get targeted by people but it wasn't the main priority and especially as we'd lost the footage the first time mm -hmm. it was all about get that we got into tunnel vision and it was my you know we're lucky that we we lived because on on four separate occasions during these sort of two hours from us being rounded up by this group of, of people and they had machetes and axes and like sharpened bits of metal and rocks and iron bars and knives and all drunk drunk out of their heads on this homemade and they're on their phones getting more people to come in and come in over the hills I mean, the best thing that's ever happened in that village ever the most interesting thing they've actually caught real vampires human vampires ready to kill their children and a white guy and a rich guy and a jeep and they've got all this they took I mean, how, 50 000 how pounds of camera when it was all happening i mean because i saw some of the footage and well, you thought, know, the camera is trembling what, what was going through your mind well it's all of us have got these cameras on us we are just you're just thinking like this is it this is it like what well, i'm th feeling so ashamed of myself like why did i follow my career to this stupid part of africa with these stupid people this is my problem you know they say like you, you see everything in your life before your death the little north london white boy who likes his arsenal football club and what's he doing in africa about to get killed by machetes then i had a, a vision of my small children holding hands walking through london zoo which is just over there about a year before and one of them stepped in a puddle and then his shoe got wet and then i had there's a a brand of children's shoes I had when I was like five called Start Right. And the, the logo of it is Jack and Jill walking up the hill with their hands together. And then I have an image of, of that and it's like click, click, click. And then I'm in my childhood and me and my sister are doing something. And I'm just, and this is all within seconds of like stones coming into us. And I'm like going like, I want to be killed by a machete now because I don't want to be killed by a stone. And, and you, they're pushing you down and down and down the hill and we're sure we're going to come out in the shambles where they kill the animals for the tribe, you know, for the village. And then we got to the place where we we're going to be murdered and there was our jeep, <laughs> not smashed to pieces and they're all in one. And I was like, it's hope, you know, like, OK, this is the beginning of the end, you know. And uh, they lined us up by this house and then one of them found the, the key to the hotel in my oh. Uh, Mikoma Lodge, the, the poshest place. Oh, we have relatives who work there, you know. And I was like, oh, I hope again, you know. And the, actually, it turns out the owner of the lodge, who I'd made friends with, he's the local politician. So hope, you know, we're going to get out of this. And then someone else says, yes, but in that Mikoma Lodge, there's a, a rich African man with his white number two guy and a few other Africans. They have two jeeps and they've been meeting the number one human body part trafficker in the whole area. And he's the evil, there, there, that man tried to kill my children. Suddenly it's all back to a thousand miles an hour. Of course, we had been meeting him. He was our number two target, <laughs> you know. Uh, how could we say there's another group of rich Africans with two Jeeps and a white man meeting? And this, is, I said, this is a tiny place. And then the security, or the village policeman said, right, this clearing was next to the chief's palace. I mean, when you say palace, it's like a one room, you know, but it's made of uh, bricks, you know, not made of and it has a metal roof. So they decide they're going to storm the chief's palace with us and take the, and the chief's wife is inside. So she's our prisoner and we're their prisoner. And then they surrounded the house and then they were going to burn down the house. And then suddenly, in the middle of all of this, we get a phone signal because everything has all gone wrong because we've got no phone signal. You know, one kilometre away from the main road, a thousand of miles away from modern times, you know, nowhere near science. Suddenly we get the phone signal again. And who's calling up? The MP is calling my phone. What, why are you calling me? Someone said that some guests from my hotel, someone's ran down the hill and said, some of your guests, I don't know if they're good or bad, but they're about to get killed up on that hill, you know? And is that you? I said, yes, it's me. But they said, you work for the BBC, but you said you work for an investment company. I said, well, we're BBC journalists, we're undercover. Oh, yeah. Well, why didn't you say you're a BBC? I love the BBC, especially the Outlook programme. It's such a good programme. Oh, no. You know, guys, man, like, this isn't the time to tell me what programme you like on the BBC. You're going to save our lives or not. You've got to tell this chief to call these people off because they are like wild dogs at the moment, you know, and make it clear to him, if they kill four BBC people, the power of the state will come down and flatten this place, you know. And luckily, 
that conversation was had, you know, and we were suddenly given like, they said, we've got five minutes to get out of this area, you know, we won't a attack you. And we jumped in the, the Jeep, all five of us from the team, plus the three people from the other car, well, the witch doctor and the other man had escaped in the melee when it first started because they looked like locals. But also the, like, 14 or so security police also wanted to come with us because Anas had promised them $100 if they oh saved our God. lives. So they all wanted their share of the $100. So we literally had about 15 people, maybe more, on, on this like large 4x4, four four, like eight inside it, two on each side hanging on, one on the back, one on the roof, one literally hanging on the... and trying to escape from this village while people are throwing stones at us and trying to block it with bricks and, and even attacking it with machetes, attacking the car. Sounds like some movie. Absolutely oh crazy, like God. a movie. And then we finally get down to the main road and we're like, it's all over. At which point, then suddenly there's a flash of blue lights everywhere and machine gun, ba 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 ba. Oh, the police have turned up, like three hours too late to save us. They now arrested us, all of us, in case we kidnapped ourselves and they didn't know who, mm -hmm. who was who. And I said, no, the luck, well, for me, obviously I wasn't local. You know, there's the one person they could be sure that if one of these guys is BBC, that's him, the white one. They um, finally accepted my story that these people had saved our lives. We'd escaped from that village. Then, they, I mean, this is the bad part, and, and this is how it all goes wrong in these countries. Then, then we had to sort of pay bribes to the police for being rescued, even though we weren't rescued. And then they didn't want to acknowledge that this crime had taken place. But we, our point was, look, we're not really that interested. This was a, the next day we managed to sort of negotiate with the village and they'd all sobered up and they were mortified. You know, what have we done? Well, we nearly killed four innocent people and, and, and journalists. You make it sound like a movie, definitely. And it's almost entertaining and horrifying equally. But yeah. it takes such a toll on, on a person. I mean, you were faced with your own death yeah it was what, i mean what, that was how the, did you cope with it afterwards I, it must have been really difficult for you i think the problems for me started when i was back in england because the production company that worked with the bbc shall we say i don't want to name names i won't go into this too much but they weren't good and they weren't good with ptsd and they weren't good with they were worried about reputational damage to themselves ahead of the mental well-being of the team that they put into danger and they tried to blame the team for it uh, the BBC didn't accept that, but being blamed by your own side um, wasn't a pleasant experience. Um, and that really made it much more traumatic because I thought at least the people who I was working for would understand and empathise, and they didn't really. They were thinking, how can we put the blame onto the, the people on the ground and protect the institution that so we, our relationship with the BBC is tight. But I'd been BBC staff for 15 years. I knew the executives I was working to much better than they did. And they looked after me and they looked after us all, but I had to go to therapy for that. I would have days where I just couldn't really get out of bed. I thought something was going to happen to me or, or if I thought, no, it's not going to happen to me. I was convinced something was going to happen to my children or my family or my wife and I wouldn't be there to protect them and, and I wouldn't be able to save them. And, you know, every knife stabbing you see in London, and it's quite a few, you know, it, it doesn't really affect me usually, but suddenly I was like, God, that could be someone, that could be I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it was really hard to work. And how are you coping now? Yeah, I'm okay, but then I think that's one of the reasons why I'm quite happy to do a story about Richard Radcliffe that's set in, <laughs> basically in West Hampstead. Yeah, that and, was definitely, not so much. you know, yeah, went, I, we I, definitely I don't went think, full circle there. You know, I'm, I'm 50 now. It's my time for going to these places is, mm -hmm. is pretty much done. You know, I mean, I, I won't do something like that again. It's just not worth it. You know, I've, I've got a, you know, enough stories for a book if I was ever minded to stories for a I mean, I'll pub. be waiting for that book, certainly. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for sharing the story. I'm so grateful that you're here today. And um, coming back to Nazanin's story, yeah. which I hope will bring something positive. I know that her life will be changed forever, but well, I'm I very happy that, you know, you're the one helping them to tell their story and we're certainly will be waiting. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, out. I think if we can bring people to account or at least show the, yeah. the truth of what happened, you know, because it has become a big international story and mm -hmm. it somehow symbolizes something bigger than just the fate of one individual woman. Yeah. It's like a test case of how these governments treat people. Um, 
And I think it shows something important there. You know, we, we are deluding ourselves, I think, as individuals in Western countries, if we think that we count that much uh, for the powers that be, you know, in, in the face of big political agreements or military agreements.